Um, I wanted to just recap briefly what we were covering uh, last week and then just finish up uh, this discussion about uh, DNA forensics. And then uh, we'll go on to uh, the next topic. So recall that uh, on Thursday, uh, I just described to you how information is encoded in the genome and that how that uh, how specific um, uh, signatures in the genome uh, can be used to uh, assess whether or not you're related to somebody else. And that's by uh, basically uh, determining whether or not uh, in your genome you have a particular set of alleles at a number of different locations uh, in your DNA. And recall that this uh, figure is just a panel of two gels in which the different locations in the genome are assayed uh, by uh, a PCR-based method in which you count up the number of repeats in a DNA sequence. Uh, and typically, you would have two pairs of repeats, one that you got from your mother and one that you got from your father. And in some cases, if you see one repeat uh, shown, that's because uh, in that instance, those repeats, uh, the same number of repeats were inherited from uh, your parents. Um, so the technology uh, for DNA forensics is basically to determine a DNA fingerprint uh, based on the uh, repeats that are at different loci uh, in your genome. And the accuracy of determining whether your uh, fingerprint, DNA fingerprint, uh, matches with somebody else uh, is a function of how many different loci you assay at. So the name of the game in the end becomes how do you size DNA uh, in a way that's accurate and also uh, turns out fast. And so uh, I left with this equation which basically uh, tells you that the ability to resolve any two repeats, that is uh, two lengths of DNA which are uh, different by four bases, is a function of something about the gel itself, uh, either the material and how well it's able to select or interact between uh, with uh, DNA strands, um, also with the length of the gel. Uh, the longer a gel has uh, in contact with a piece of DNA, generally uh, the better you are able to resolve one piece of DNA from the other. And then factors which uh, broaden the band, so uh, either time or diffusion, which uh, in this term is, includes uh, the temperature at which you do the assay. So if you want to improve resolution, then you either change the gel, you make the gel longer, or you minimize uh, the effects from either how you inject the sample into, uh, into the gel or how you control diffusion and broadbanding. So uh, instead of running these DNA fragments on a, a slab of acrylamide or agros or some sort of monolithic 2D sheet of gel, um, the latest configuration in DNA analysis is based on MEMS. Okay? So MEMS is the anachronism for microelectromechanical systems. But in this case, uh, instead of... Uh, uh, an electronic uh, uh, design, uh, we have a design for biology. So instead of wires, uh, you have channels. Uh, instead of electrons flowing through wires, you have DNA or protein flowing down channels. Okay, so the analogy is directly uh, the same. Uh, and the formats uh, are shown here. So um, in this chip, and notice that the scale here is one centimeter. Uh, you have areas where you inject, uh, uh, you load your DNA sample. These are the lanes in which the DNA is uh, resolved. There is a waste reservoir. And somewhere down here, you're scanning across all eight lanes in this particular configuration to, to uh, detect the pieces of DNA as they come by. So uh, just to give you a sense of performance, uh, these are two alleles at four different loci. 
separated on a slab gel like the one you just saw two slides ago. And so you see, uh, you know, these two alleles are well resolved and so on. And the time it took for this uh, band to pass or to resolve on the gel was approximately a couple hours. Uh, currently, uh, most uh, DNA testing is done not on slabs of gels, but on fine capillaries, glass capillaries, which are filled with gels. So now we've uh, basically eliminated all the extraneous gel and now inject <coughs> DNA into the capillary. And the capillary uh, contains the sample. And so you see, again, these two same uh, four sets of alleles uh, now separated in a capillary system. And now the time scale here is less than an hour. Okay, so there's a significant improvement in speed or performance without sacrificing uh, resolution. Uh, notice that uh, one difference is that signal to noise is poorer here than in the slab gel, but it's still uh, acceptable because you can still see the, uh, the peaks. Um, in contrast, uh, let's compare the performance uh, where you inject these same set of four alleles, uh, loci, uh, on one of these microchips, where now the time scale is on the order of a couple minutes. And you can see that you can resolve both of these alleles just as well as you can on a slab gel. But uh, again, now the time dimension is minutes rather than hour, uh, hours. So we've improved performance on, in a log scale rather than in a lin at a linear scale. So anytime you achieve log, log scale perf gains in performance, for whatever metric you are measuring, uh, it's, it's a real win. Now, these little peaks here are actually the DNA ladders uh, that are co-injected with the sample. So it gives you actually a better sense of how well these microchips can work in resolving uh, the different DNA fragments than, uh, the, uh, than what you might see in these other systems. So the take-home message is maybe these microfabricated formats uh, are better than uh, current technology. How do they work? Well, remember I said that you have channels etched in glass through standard photolithography methods. So if you uh, take the uh, fab course uh, in, uh, uh, over in uh, the Stata Center, then you know, you'll, or in Building 38, then you know, you'll be able to uh, fashion one of these uh, devices. You have a, a well uh, that's uh, etched in glass. You have a T configuration in which you have a separation channel. And across it is designed a sample loading well and a waste exit well. So you load your sample, uh, you fill these uh, channels uh, with gel. You load your sample in this well. You electrophoresis uh, or pull the DNA across that channel uh, by setting up an electric field. And then uh, when this intersection is filled with DNA, you change the polarities on the uh, ends of the channel and you pull back the DNA samples in the uh, wings, and you launch uh, this plug of DNA down the separation channel. And then uh, as the sample uh, is sized through the gel, you separate the different DNA fragments, and then you detect them as they go past uh, a point at the end of the channel. Okay. Now, uh, I told you something about factors that affect resolution. This is uh, just a uh, uh, time-lapse movie uh, where we're imaging the injector if filled with DNA to the sample. And now we're switching the polarity. And we're looking, this is fluorescently labeled DNA. And so you're seeing the DNA as it's uh, being launched down the separation channel. Notice that the DNA is getting concentrated as it uh, starts to uh, initiate its separation. So this concentration factor is one of the reasons why the resolution is much better uh, in this format. Because there's a change in not only the polarity on the gel, but it turns out there's buffer and ion uh, gradients that are also set up, uh, which help you um, resolve uh, these pieces of DNA because you concentrate them uh, in, a, in a much narrower band. Okay, so that's, that's where you gain on one part of the equation. Uh, you can run these gels uh, longer uh, or you can run these fragments through longer and longer channels. Obviously, 
you'll be able to resolve them better. But we saw that even for very short channels, we have adequate resolution. So here, length is actually not as uh, a main consideration. In fact, the short length is, is also uh, an advantage because the shorter the lane, the faster the run is accomplished. So you can uh, analyze samples much more quickly, as you saw in these short microfabricated formats than in these long slab gels. The other reason is, is that because these channels are only on the order of 100 microns wide and 40 microns deep, whatever heat is, dis is generated is, is rapidly dissipated. So again, that diffusion broadening parameter is minimized in this format than compared to the other formats. And then this just shows that uh, something that we saw in the other um, uh, figure, which is that we can analyze or multiplex uh, the analysis of several of these loci uh, at once in the same uh, injection. So we can resolve all of these different alleles in these four different loci. And then by looking uh, with a scanner at different wavelengths and injecting uh, samples that are uh, made with uh, different color primers, uh, we can then multiplex uh, additional loci uh, by uh, including color as the uh, uh, additional variable or parameter. Okay, so you can see how uh, we can, in one single device, uh, improve on the speed and uh, of the DNA uh, detection and resolution without or detection without sacrificing uh, resolution. And that's basically the basis for um, that's basically the basis for. Sorry, I can't, uh, I can't talk and do my PowerPoints at the same time. Uh, and, and that's the basis for what we think will be uh, how we're going to be able to genotype DNA uh, in the future. Um, devices based on the ones I've shown you are now <coughs> uh, in test where uh, the forensics uh, units are bringing them, put them into a van bringing them out to the field and are actually testing uh, DNA samples at the field. So I think my goal is uh, maybe I want to be uh, on this TV show, CSI, as you know, sort of the, maybe the geeky uh, technician that does a DNA test. Okay, any questions about uh, what we just covered uh, over the last couple of days? If you have questions, you know, feel free to, th this is a seminar. So seminars, by definition, are not lectures, although they probably seem like they are. So if you really do have questions, please feel free to uh, interrupt. Uh, this, this is really to help give you some background information about uh, the basis for uh, uh, bioengineering. Okay, what I want to do now is to switch to a related topic about how information is encoded in the genome. But instead of talking about uh, information as in the strictest sense of sequence of DNA, uh, let's go up one level or two levels of complexity in biological structure and talk about how function is encoded in the genome. Okay. So it's, it's easy to understand that the genome is a linear sequence of DNA bases. But then how do you go from that information, which is basically a parts list, of the different proteins that are uh, synthesized in a cell to including the instruction set that tells those proteins what to do, right? There's no other information that's encoded in the, in the genome in other parts of the genome that says this protein, you know, carries out this catalytic reaction. It's all, it's all intrinsic to the DNA sequence of that protein. So what we'll do is uh, uh, I'll cover two important concepts uh, in uh, understanding biological structure, which is that uh, there's basically two ways of building up structure. Either you, you do it by chemistry, i.e. making chem covalent bonds, or by self-assembly. And self-assembly is through interactions by ionic forces or attractions or repulsions, van der Waals interactions, and hydrophobic interactions. And it's those three sets of interactions that really are responsible for higher order structure from the protein level up. 
And then what I'll do is I'll, dis I'll show you an example of, in which self-assembly is responsible for generating force and organizing, in this case, uh, the genome in daughter cells during mitosis. And we'll talk about a little bit about the machinery, the protein machinery, that the cell constructs transiently in order to separate and partition uh, the, the genome in chromosomes. And then we'll talk about how that dynamics is the important target for anti-cancer drugs. And then we'll go into a little bit about um, some aspects of uh, what we uh, know and think about uh, anti-tumor drugs. Now, there's a reading if you want to get a better overview of uh, this whole area. And it's, a, it's an excellent review in uh, Nature Reviews in Cancer by Marianne Jordan and Les Wilson, who are at uh, University of Santa Barbara. OK, now, let's go back. Uh, we have genes. They encode a linear sequence of DNA. And in the end, what those genes uh, represent is the machinery that executes whatever the information is in the genome to make a cell and uh, carry out the functions of a cell. To get to here from the DNA, we have to go through an intermediate step in which the four-letter DNA code is translated into a 20-letter or more amino acid code. And you know, this whole area encompasses in 701 and in 703 and 705 and 706 all of transcription, regulation of gene expression, and protein, uh, and protein synthesis. Okay, so uh, in bioengineering, we've managed to compress that down to one minute or two minutes. Now, this 20-letter code is just the linear sequence of amino acids, but uh, it's important that uh, we understand how the execution of, of function is carried out by this machinery. And uh, it all involves self-assembly, uh, as I uh, alluded to earlier. And it has to do with how that linear string of DNA, or protein, sorry, uh, folds up. So again, uh, this is just basic uh, biological structure. You have the amino acids here represented in one letter code. Um, it's uh, a one-to-one -one correspondence between an amino acid and three bases in the DNA sequence. So the codons to amino acid. But what happens next is that each amino acid has a particular chemical characteristic, either hydrophobic or hydrophilic. It's charged or polar, nonpolar, whatever. Okay, And it's those. Uh, characteristics or properties of amino acids where in their local environment they dictate how this amino acid will interact with the amino acids around it. And so what you find is that uh, the linear sequence of amino acids in a polypeptide fold locally into a, a secondary level of, of structure. So sometimes the amino acids, if they are uh, able to interact with each other, will collapse not into a string of, the string of amino acids will collapse into a coil. Okay. Or you'll have a string of amino acids that will uh, be uh, arranged as a, as a short straight uh, sheet or a uh, short straight strand of protein. And so if you look at the linear sequence and map onto it in, in the protein structure, what are the secondary, uh, how the protein sequence is organized in secondary structure, you have these uh, regions in which you have local folds of helices and strands. Now, that doesn't tell you how the protein works. It just tells you how the protein is organized at, that, at this local level. Now, just as pro, uh, amino acids interact with each other to give you these local organized bits of, of polypeptide, then it's also true that uh, these uh, structures, uh, they have also chemical characteristics. They interact with the surrounding amino acids. And you can see how you, you get bits or parts of protein uh, folding up on itself from these local folds. And in fact, if you look at the structure of a protein, and I forgot actually which one this one is, you can see that uh, 
In this case, the structure was determined by X-ray crystallography. And you can see that uh, you have the polypeptide chain starting here, meanders around. Um, let's see, it goes someplace here anyway. It comes around, comes around, comes around in, st in strands. These strands form part of a sheet. Then you have a helix that's rather long. Oh, actually, I missed out someplace. The end terminus goes this way, this way, this way, this way. So you have four strands in a sheet. Then you have a long helix. And then now you have these four sheets, or strands, and then this long helix. So there's actually like a two-fold axis of symmetry uh, described in the structure. It's formed these four strands, and these four strands are contiguous in space, but they're actually discontiguous in sequence but they form the uh, floor uh, over which is overlaid two helices. And so you can imagine that this forms a binding pocket for something else. Okay. So that's just, that's just uh, an illustration of how locally folded elements, when organized into three dimensions, collapse into a compact structure uh, in which they're connected by loops or turns there's other parts of the sequence which have no defined or apparent regular structure to them. But that, that's you know, basically the elements that give rise to uh, uh, folded protein. Uh, proteins can be all helical. They can be all sheet. They can be a combination of the two. Uh, they can have a lot of random structure. Depends on the sequence. Depends actually on the context of the sequence. Okay. Now. Uh, so the process then is how does a polypeptide chain end up in a native folded structure? And so what I just described to you was that uh, elements of local sequence will fold up into something that's semi-ordered. So we call that a molten globule. Other parts will fold up sometimes into local folds as well. And that these will coalesce into the final native structure. Now, um, a curious thing is that if you look at all the permutations of how a protein can fold up based on the flexibility of the bonds that link individual amino acids, uh, it, could take, it should take a long time. But obviously, proteins fold much faster than that. So there must be pathways through this complexity in uh, various states of fold and unfold of proteins uh, so that uh, the protein typically folds in, the, in a matter of a minute or so in the test tube. And in, in a cell, actually, it's even faster than that. So what is it, res what's responsible for uh, getting proteins to fold faster? And generally, you can understand that as proteins get bigger and bigger and bigger, then how do different parts find each other? Folding must be intrinsically more difficult for things that are big than things that are small. And the answer is that uh, in the last decade or so, uh, we found that there are proteins, machines, called chaperones and chaperonins, which are large macromolecular structures you know, on the order of ribosomes or larger, which take the polypeptide chain as they come out of the ribosome and bind to the polypeptide chain, preventing the polypeptide chain from folding in an indiscriminate manner as it's being synthesized uh, so that uh, when the polypeptide chain is being synthesized, you get uh, discrete steps in folding of the protein uh, to its properly folded state. Or alternatively, uh, the uh, protein as it's being synthesized is then uh, helped in its folding by these large macromolecular uh, complexes and, uh, and then folded properly within these uh, protein machines. So it's the sh machinery that the cell has which allows uh, protein synthesis to occur uh, in a relatively error-free uh, manner. OK, so we've gone now from linear sequence in amino acids to local folds. But that's not function, right? If you look at. Uh, whether or not this protein can carry out its function, whether it's an enzyme to catalyze a chemical reaction or some protein that's designed to bind something, um, it's probably not going to happen. It's only after the entire polypeptide chain has folded in its correct configuration. And so 
it's in that three-dimensional context of the structure that the protein is able to execute uh, what it's, it was uh, designed to do. And so function is uh, something that's encoded in three-dimensional structure, but the three-dimensional structure in turn is a consequence of the linear sequence of amino acids. So you can see then how the DNA sequence which, and a protein sequence, which I referred to as hardwired instructions, then give rise to uh, these other higher order functions that aren't hardwired but act, come out as a consequence of how those uh, instructions or how those uh, amino acids fold up. So uh, function requires correct uh, folding and self-assembly of uh, parts of amino acids into a protein. Okay, now let's take that concept of self-assembly. So these are, again, local interactions, electrostatic, hydrophobic, van der Waals interactions. No covalent bonds made and show how higher order structure is built up within a cell. Okay, so this is uh, the cytoskeleton. Now, if you take a mechanics course, what you'll find out is that a measure of stiffness, the material properties of protein, is that a protein has a Young's modulus on the order of a gigapascal. Okay? Now, gigapascal to you may not represent much, but just think of um, a hard plastic material like polystyrene. That has a Young's modulus of about a gigapascal as well. Yet, if you push on a cell, you'll find that its stiffness is on the order of a kilopascal. So something, even though it's made of protein, which are hard, uh, the structures that those proteins assemble to is relatively soft. Now, what's the basis for that material property? Well, um, let's look at how structure and then now property of a material is built up from, uh, by, through self-assembly. This, this is an actin filament. It's a polymer of actin subunits. Uh, the subunits here are depicted as red, white, and blue just so that you could distinguish their positions in the polymer. So it's a linear filament. Um, protein subunits tend to add at one end of the polymer uh, compared to the other, so it's polarized in its, both in its structure and its, in its assembly. Now, uh, the, the filament itself is organized into a higher level structure in the cell this is an electron micrograph through the outer region of a cell not much different than this. And what you can see is that it, there's a network or a mat of filaments. Now this could look disorganized to you, and maybe it is at some level, but if we look in much more detail at you know, discrete regions in this, you see that the filaments are organized in a very logical way, in that uh, off of one filament, is a branch, off of that filament is a branch, off of that filament is a branch. So each filament uh, somehow gives rise to additional filaments through this branching process. That means that there must be some other protein which is starting this or nucleating the assembly of a branch. Um, and then remember that uh, filaments grow by adding at the ends. And if we look in this structure, we would see that the ends are certainly here in this structure, but if we were to look at all the ends, uh, most of the ends, free ends in, in this meshwork actually lie at the outer regions of, of, this, uh, uh, of, of the cell. Now let's think back to what I told you about the assembly. Subunits add preferentially to one end, and it turns out that this end is the preferred end for assembly or addition of subunits. So imagine what happens in a cell. You have actin subunits that are adding to this end of the filament. Mass is conserved in the cell. So what must happen? You, you would see a translocation of the entire mass uh, distally in this picture, or as you're seeing in this uh, time-lapse movie of a cell, you're seeing mass being transported centripetally to, toward the nucleus of the cell. So what this movie is showing you is self-assembly in action, uh, where it's uh, capturing what we infer is assembly of subunits, addition of subunits at the end of these filaments. The entire mass of polymer, the network of filaments, um, are being 
are, in a sense, treadmilling its way or translocating its way to uh, this part of the cell. If mass is conserved, you balance the equation of addition and sub there must be subtraction, and you reuse the subunits. Okay? So this is, in fact, uh, how we think cells move. It turns out that uh, this cell is stuck to uh, the glass cover slip by polylysine. The forces of adhesion are so strong that the cell can't move, right? But if you were to let the cell make and then break adhesions, then this uh, translocation of subunits will then change its reference so that the, uh, that, the, that the membrane would then be pushed forward instead of the whole mass of polymer being pushed back. Okay, so this is on the order of nanonewtons of force. Addition of subunits at the end of each filament end by itself is on the order of a piconewton of force. Okay, self-assembly. Now, let's take that same example of self-assembly and let's look at a related but different uh, system. Now, um, remember in uh, the second lecture, I talked about how uh, the genome, you know, there's 10 to the 13th cells in the human body. There's 10 to the 16th uh, total cells during your lifetime. That means there must be on that order of cell divisions in which the entire contents of your genome must be faithfully and accurately replicated and then distributed to the daughter cells. That machinery for distribution of the chromosomes or the genome from one cell uh, among two daughter cells is one of the functions of microtubules. Okay, so again, it's an element or component of the cytoskeleton of the cell, and it's the machinery that's responsible for doing a certain kind of work. What I'm going to tell you about is a little bit about the biochemistry and the cell biology of microtubules. It's something, again, you should have gotten in 701, also in 706, hopefully in 703 and 705, um, if you take biology. Uh, and then I'm going to tell you about how um, microtubule function in cell division uh, can be used as a wedge or a handle at treating uh, cancers, which are characterized by uncontrolled cell division, by use of drugs that are specifically designed or were discovered to act directly on the ability of microtubules to generate force. Okay, so it's a mechanics-based problem. Microtubules. Uh, we, we just saw what an actin filament is. It's a linear polymer. Uh, here, a microtubule uh, is composed of a heterodimer, or the subunit, the building block of, a mic of the polymer is a heterodimer of an alpha and a beta tubulin protein. They uh, associate into a stable heterodimer, and that heterodimer, in some way that I'll show you later, uh, adds to the uh, adds in a way that you build up not a, a filament but a tube. So this is a tube in the true sense. It has a hollow core, and it has a wall, which are composed of the microtubule or tubulin subunits. And we uh, define that the the subunits add in a polarized direction and they add uh, end on end. Uh, the wall of the microtubules are actually organized as protofilaments, uh, which are uh, linear strings of the uh, tubulin subunit. Now, an important um, aspect of microtubule function has to do with mitosis. So here you see the genome condensing, the genome and chromosomes condensing, organizing uh, during mitosis in the metaphase plate. And then now you're going to see the cell separate or partition the uh, copies of DNA from one daughter cell and the other daughter cell. The cell will divide in half to form the daughter cells. Okay, that's basic uh, cell biology. You must have gotten that in high school. Now, this is an experiment uh, which, in which the microtubules in the cell are stained with either an antibody against tubulin and the antibody is uh, tagged with a fluorescent tag so that you can see this in the light uh, fluorescence microscope. 
and in which the DNA or some component of the DNA is, is differentially tagged with a different dye. Uh, in this case, it could be a dye that uh, stains DNA bases. Okay? So blue is DNA, green is microtubules. And what you see is that uh, during the steps in which the chromosomes uh, organize into uh, the meta and are brought, aligned into the metaphase plate and then separated, you find that the cell has a distribution of microtubules that seem random in some way. And then what the cell does is entirely disassemble its whole cohort of cytoplasmic microtubules and then reassembles them around uh, the DNA or in order to uh, organize the DNA. So you have now a bipolar structure. Uh, the bipolar structure then uh, assembles microtubules between them. And then uh, what happens is that there's a machine. Uh, the microtubules, again, are dynamic structures. That is, they're adding, continually adding tubulin subunits to the ends of microtubules and taking uh, tubulin subunits off of the opposite ends of microtubules. And so you see that uh, you have a specialized microtubule structure or machine whose sole function is to organize the chromosomes and then distribute the chromosomes to daughter cells. And so here you have the, uh, what's called the mitotic spindle in anaphase, where literally the microtubules are pulling the chromosomes apart. How is that done? Uh, in several ways. Uh, one way involves this concept of flux or treadmilling of microtubule subunits through the polymer. So there's addition, preferential addition of microtubules at one end of the polymer. The, all the microtubules in the structure are uh, organized in the same way, so they, they have a polarity that's uniform in the structure. Okay, so let's, uh, let me explain to you an experiment uh, in which we can see, you can see this motion of material going from the center to the ends. This is the, uh, where the chromosomes lie. It's basically this picture on its side. And then uh, with time, you see a flux of material moving uh, to opposite poles or ends of the structure. Now, why are we able to see this flux? Well, there was a technique uh, or method developed called speckle microscopy in which uh, you add a tubulin subunit, which is tagged with a fluorescent uh, dye. So you can see the microtubule in the, in the microscope. However, if, if the entire microtubule was composed of this tagged tubulin subunit, the whole microtubule will appear as a line, a fluorescent line. The trick is, and, and if there's movement or, or flux among the subunits, you would never see it because there would be nothing to distinguish one part of a microtubule from the other. However, if you add the tubulin subunits that are fluorescently tagged at a very, very small relative amount compared to the amount of protein in the polymer, then you see that the microtubule will appear speckled if you were able to see it as an individual microtubule in the light microscope. So in contrast, instead of seeing a solid or contiguous line of fluorescence, you would see a discontiguous, maybe a line in fluorescence, uh, maybe you might not even be able to distinguish it as one microtubule because the labeling is so low. However, um, imagine, so that's why you see these speckles here instead of the lines of microtubules that we saw, for instance, in this picture. You know, in this picture, we see the microtubules as linear, linear objects. Okay, so here's the experiment. Um, you just take a time-lapse movie like this, and for each frame, you physically box out one uh, segment, which we show here as the chromosomes in green and the speckles that happen to be in that box. Now, what you see in the subsequent time frames is that the chromosomes basically stay in place. They're not moving during that, in that interval. But notice what happens here. You see lines or traces of flux in which 
these, this speckle appears to be moving with time in a direction that's opposite to the position of the uh, chromosome. That is, you have a biradial uh, flow of material from the chromosomes toward the poles of the uh, mitotic apparatus. What that's telling you is that material is being added here and, uh, and that that fiduciary marker on the microtubule is now moving out, implying that there's new material that's being added at the chromosomes during metaphase. So it sh it, you see this as a flux or movement of material outward toward the pole at metaphase. So because there's a flux, it means that it's doing work. But in this case, the work is unproductive because the chromosomes are staying in place. It's as if you have a car engine in which the engine is, is revving up, but what the problem is is that you don't have the clutch engaged, right? Now what happens at the next stage is that the cell actually asks questions at a biochemical level and says, are all the chromosomes aligned? Are all the chromosomes attached to microtubules? Is everything else you know, sort of OK? If so, yes, let's get started. And what happens is that there are proteins that keep the sister chromatids or the pairs of chromosomes physically uh, together. And those bonds between those proteins break. These proteins are called cohesins. And they break. And if you take 703 from uh, Professor Orr Weaver, her lab uh, studies these cohesin proteins. So if the bonds between the chromosomes break, then obviously any force directed on the chromosomes is now uh, transduced into the movement of the chromosomes. That's one part of it. You have to have uh, the chromosomes separating, but also you have to get the uh, flux of incorporation of microtubules uh, at, at the chromosomes to be translated into a pulling force. And that re requires another set of proteins which are designed uh, that are on the chromosomes to actually latch on to the end of a of a chromosome, and then thereby uh, being transported out uh, as, uh, as mitosis continues. Okay, so that's how you get chromosomes to the end. Once they're to the opposite poles, cells divide in half, you have two daughter cells. Mitosis is finished. Now, cancer, if you think about it, is basically a problem in unregulated cell division. Tumors grow because cells divide when they're not supposed to, in places that they're not supposed to, at times when they're not supposed to. So this whole process of cell division somehow goes awry. Also, the cells move to different places in the body and start tumors at different sites. So this is just a picture of some organ, um, probably liver, and you can see these different tumor masses in it. And at a histological level, in the light microscope, you can distinguish these uh, blocks or aggregates of tumor cells uh, from normal cells. So anti-cancer treatments are designed to kill tumor cells uh, differentially. You don't want to kill normal cells. Or somehow control uh, the uh, properties of a tumor cell relative to a normal cell. Right? A tumor cell is not that much different than a normal cell. It's on the order of a few mutations uh, in the genome that's being expressed. So where does microtubules come in? Uh, the seminal observation was uh, about uh, 25 or 35 years ago uh, when uh, Susan Horowitz's group uh, discovered that a drug or a chemical compound that the uh, National Cancer Institute had isolated uh, and found to have anti-cancer properties or anti-tumor properties. Um, basically, you know, and the structure is shown here, had an unusual property of causing the microtubules in a cell not to break down. So you can think of, you know, how do you disrupt mitosis? Well, if you can't form the structure in the first place, then obviously the cell can't divide. However, what, that's not what happened. If you look at these micrographs, where again you have chromosomes in blue and microtubules, in this case in red, you see that the cell is able to form microtubules, but in the presence of taxol, uh, you have committed the microtubules to assemble in such a way that you have uh, disorganized the DNA. So here you have chromosomes at the poles instead of all at the metaphase plate. You have this aberrant kind of structure and so on. So uh, there's unregulated assembly 
of microtubules. And the important property is that um, what they found was that this uh, taxol binds and stabilizes the microtubules. So you prevent the dynamics from occurring. If the microtubules aren't dynamic, then from a mechanics point of view, it can't generate force. If it can't generate force, then there's nothing to separate the microtubule, uh, the chromosomes. Okay, so this is a mechanic. You can think of this as a chemically based problem, but it really is, in fact, a mechanics based problem, i.e., why you're a bioengineer. Now, what is it of microtubule dynamics? We saw it in the time lapse movie from the speckle microscopy. Uh, the basis for uh, dynamics is that microtubules, like actin filaments, are polar in their structure. So one end is chemically different than the other end. Subunits add preferentially to one end or the other. So in this case, the preferred end of a microtubule, if we if backtrack just one second, if we mark a set of microtubules, just say we can tag them with a dye or something, um, and then we watch how a microtubule grows, uh, what we'll see is that on average, one end will grow longer than the other end. But also notice that uh, the, there's a dynamic even to the assembly of uh, microtubules in that they go through these uh, cycles of assembly and disassembly. So that if you trace any one microtubule uh, length, you'll see that it'll fluctuate uh, over a large range of lengths with time because it's adding and subtracting subunits at both ends. Both ends are in dynamic flux but one end is, is dominating over the other. So microtubules go like this, well actually like this, right? Now what happens when you add taxol? Taxol binds to the walls of the microtubule and somehow prevents this dynamic uh, uh, disassembly reaction from happening. So it's as if the taxol binds and glues the subunits together. What you see that is that as a microtubule, if a microtubule forms, it's likely to stay either its length or it may grow longer. Sometimes it may grow shorter, but it doesn't have the dynamic characteristic like uh, a native microtubule would have. So taxol works at the molecular level by affecting how a microtubule breaks down. How does that work? Well, I gave you the clue before. This is a diagram of the wall of a microtubule Taxol actually binds on the inside, uh, and it, it in fact uh, is binding at a site in which it affects uh, the, not only the microtubule it's bound, or the tubulin subunit that it's bound to, but also its neighbors. You could look at it and you can actually envisage why it prevents disassembly. Right now, in this position, it seems as though it's acting to uh, bind these subunits all together. Okay, so that's, that's the interpretation of how uh, Taxol works. Uh, these happen to be the locations of where other drugs, anti-cancer drugs work, that are also targets, whose targets are microtubules. Uh, uh, Colchicine is a compound which causes microtubules to break down instead of microtubules to uh, be stable. And uh, at very low concentrations, it also prevents uh, the microtubule from being dynamic. There's a third drug called vinblastine. It's actually one of the earliest ones being, that were used, which binds solely to the ends of microtubules. Again, it affects the dynamics uh, in much the same way that uh, taxol does. Okay, so microtubules are the main structure uh, of the protein machine that separates chromosomes. From the dynamics, you got a good idea, I hope, that it's also the uh, part of the structure that's responsible for generating the motive force for separating chromosomes. So it's logical that a microtubule would be a target uh, for treating cancer because if you can control unregulated cell division, which happens faster than normal cell division, then maybe you have uh, uh, a wedge into uh, 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 controlling uh, a tumor or the size of a tumor. And so these are current, uh, a table from the uh, Jordan and Wilson review of the different uh, drugs that are designed to 
act on microtubules and uh, where they are in their uh, clinical phase. Okay, so uh, Taxol is a very uh, important drug in cancer treatment. Um, it's uh, a very complex molecule. It's extracted from the yew tree, uh, Pacific yew tree, which is not a very good source for the material. So the routes for uh, making Taxol is through chemical synthesis. You can start from uh, the base molecules and build up the synthesis, and that's you know like a 50-step synthesis. Or you can identify an intermediate, a naturally occurring intermediate, which you can use as a base, in which in a four-step process you can then build up uh, Taxol, and that's the economically uh, favored route for uh, synthesizing Taxol. Um, as a bioengineer, you would think of other ways of synthesizing Taxol, maybe cloning all genes in Taxol synthesis pathway and having them you know, generate or make Taxol in a bacterium or something like that. And that's actually a topic for a term paper that you can use. So the bioengineering aspect has to do with making Taxol. Taxol is insoluble. So you have to uh, uh, inject it uh, with an oil to uh, keep the solubility up. So you, know, you can engineer the molecule to also have better solubility properties and delivery properties. Let me just end by another application of Taxol. Now, uh, it's used to control cell division. Let's think about uh, stents and the operation of stents. Uh, when you go in and you basically scrub the wall of a, of a blood vessel, you put in place this metal scaffold, which is designed to keep the, the wall open. However, one common problem is that the cells in the lining of this wall overgrow that scaffold and gradually grow back and block that uh, vessel. So that's, that's a bad thing. Um, I'll just alert you to that uh, Taxol, or one uh, new development in uh, stents is to then coat them with drugs that are designed to knock down or to slow down cell growth around that stent. And of course, Taxol is one of those uh, drugs that is embedded in a polymer that's designed to slowly release Taxol so that you do uh, knock down or keep down uh, cell growth, uh, which is called restenosis. Okay? So, uh, that's an example where we understand the basic biology, we understand the technological applications, and uh, a little bit of how engineering in the chemistry uh, will get you from one to the other. Think about other examples how chemistry or engineering can uh, help us with uh, relating taxol with uh, cancer. <laughs>